This episode, we take a look at Marvel's Ant-Man here on the Robotic Movie Project. Ant-Man is a ridiculous concept to build a movie around. A superhero that can shrink to the size of an ant, retain his human strength and speed with the ability to communicate with ants and form his very own army of insects to help him? Yep, it's ridiculous, all right. And that's why it works. And that's why it works so well. Closing out what's known as Phase 2, Ant-Man is the 12th movie from Marvel Studios. Once again, we find the skeptics sitting around waiting for one of these movies to fail. And I'm happy to tell them to keep waiting, because this is not the one. Directed by Peyton Reed and starring Paul Rudd as Scott Lang, Ant-Man has had a troubled history in making its way to the big screen. In the 1980s, Ant-Man was optioned to New World Entertainment just around the same time Disney, Marvel's now parent company, was developing Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and the production of the film was shelved. In 2000, King of All Media, Howard Stern, met with Marvel in an attempt to buy the movie rights to Ant-Man. In May of that year, Artisan announced a deal to put the film into production. In 2003, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and The World's End director, Edgar Wright, along with his writing partner, Joe Cornish, wrote a script for a film version of Ant-Man centered around Scott Lang. In 2007, Kevin Feige announced that he had hired Wright to direct a film version. With Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, and The Incredible Hulk, all scheduled for Marvel's Phase 1, Ant-Man got pushed back to 2015 as part of Marvel's Phase 2. In 2012, at Comic-Con, when Wright presented his test footage, featuring a costume similar to the final version, everything seemed to be going well. By the spring of 2014, Wright had cast Paul Rudd as Scott Lang, Michael Douglas as Dr. Hank Pym, Evangeline Lilly as Hope Van Dyne, and Corey Stoll was in negotiations to play Darren Cross. However, by May of 2014, Wright announced that he dropped out of directing the film, citing creative differences. Without a director and Marvel insisting that the film be completed on time, Kevin Feige tapped Bring It On director Peyton Reed, and Paul Rudd helped finish the script that was left by Edgar Wright. Although part of the larger Marvel Cinematic Universe, Ant-Man doesn't deal with the large-scale threats that a film like Avengers or Captain America The Winter Soldier deals with. In the film, Dr. Hank Pym, played by Douglas, resigns from his own company when he finds out the Ant-Man tech powered by the Pym particle is going to be sold to the military by S.H.I.E.L.D. as a weapon. 25 years later, after burying the technology, Pym's protege, Darren Cross, played by Corey Stoll, rediscovers the Pym particle and is in the process of initiating a hostile takeover of the company and selling the Yellow Jacket suit to Hydra. Pym has been secretly monitoring Scott Lang, a former electronics engineer who is just out of prison and down on his luck, in order to train him as the new Ant-Man to the objection of his daughter, Hope Van Dyne, played by Evangeline Lilly. Director Peyton Reed is great at keeping the film moving forward, and considering the obscure nature of this material, that's a job well done. The characters are all fully flushed out and never become cardboard cutouts, with the exception of Stoll's character, who does seem a bit one-dimensional at times. By the end, it's revealed that Pym and Cross have had more of an Obi-Wan, Anakin, Skywalker-type relationship that went south. The whole undercurrent of the film is that this is not just about saving the world, but about family. Scott Lang's desire to become a superhero is not as grandiose as saving the world, but to reconnect with his daughter Cassandra, played by Abby Ryder. The film also deals with the fractured relationship of Pym and Hope Van Dyne, as well as the former mentor-protege relationship of Pym and Cross. It's those kind of real-world stakes that keeps a film like Ant-Man grounded and makes it connect with an audience the way that other films in the genre don't. Judy Greer appears as Cassandra's mother and Lang's ex-wife. But of all the supporting players, it's Michael Pena who steals every scene. Not merely providing comic relief, Pena served as Lang's link to the outside world, and he is unknowingly responsible for Lang coming into contact with Hank Pym. Anthony Mackie also makes an appearance, as the Falcon, providing a link to the rest of the Marvel Universe. Up until this point, Ant-Man feels very much like its own film, as it does stand on its own two feet. The action peaks in the third act, with a final epic battle scene played out on a child's train set that is played for last but doesn't come across feeling cheap or tacked on. Even though this is one of the funniest Marvel movies yet, it is never a farce. To director Peyton Reed's credit, he knows exactly when to play it for laughs and when not to. Even though Ant-Man is a superhero film, it does play more like an Ocean's Eleven style heist movie. This is no Thomas Crown affair, but it is a nice change of pace in the genre. The CGI effects give this film a huge sense of scale. The shrinking effects seem almost hypnotic at times, and the peek into the quantum realm could give hints into Marvel's future films. Two post credit scenes help set up future movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but for the sake of spoilers, I won't reveal them here. Ant-Man more than holds its own compared to the other Marvel films, and serves as a great companion piece to the other movies. Considering the troubled history of this film, it could have been much, much worse. Marvel's Ant-Man gets a solid 4 out of 6 Chewbacca's. That's it for now. See you next time. One question. 
Is it too late to change the name? My power.